Okay. Okay. Usually I have to put the mic down because I'm too short. This is actually a nice change. Um, this evening, we're going to have a lecture by Christine Hawley and Peter Cook. I'll give you a, I guess a few statistics first and then uh, make a few comments. They've been working together since 1975. Um, their practice is, I guess, primarily based in London, but it's actually based wherever they happen to be at the time. Uh, Christine um, studied at the AA, the Architectural Association in London from 1969 to 1975 and, and uh, uh, since then she's, she's taught at, at the Chelsea School of Art in London, at the AA, at the uh, Stadel School in Frankfurt and currently uh, teaches at uh, North London Polytechnic. Um, Peter also graduated from the AA a few years before Christine. He's uh, taught at numerous places around the world, um, currently teaches at the AA and is the, uh, um, the department, the, the, uh, the chairman of the department, if, if that's the correct term, uh, the head of the architecture department at the Stadel School in Frankfurt, which is um, a, a very old art academy. Um, which I found, I, I guess, just initially, quite instinctively, um, a rather curious appointment, um, um, knowing um, sort of Peter's history in, in the world of architecture and, and uh, considering um, how serious uh, um, Germans have tended to be. The, the one thing that was quite, uh, um, I think, interesting to me in thinking about the, uh, the difference between the Germans and perhaps the English was uh, when I was in school, um, uh, the, the group of people that Peter initially worked with, there was five of them, there was a group called Archogram, which is uh, probably has been one of the most uh, influential uh, uh, groups producing uh, ideas, I think, instead of architecture, producing ideas, which I think is um, um, a critical difference, um, that influenced the whole generation. And they were very concrete ideas. Um, just about everything you saw built at Osaka 70 um, had sort of previously been produced by, by the Archogram group. The, uh, um, one of the uh, sort of curious uh, things was uh, for us here to understand um, two different, the two different ways of working in a team. Um, the English tended to, uh, tended to work in, in a way um, that they grouped uh, together, um, because they have an they had an affinity for the same things, that it was um, it was many people with many ideas uh, working towards uh, uh, one goal, which uh, was to take the ideas and make them reality. Whereas um, a part of uh, my generation, we we learned that the team approach had to do with one idea for everybody, and it was to make a single unit out of everybody, as opposed to I think. Uh, the way our school was founded here, which in, in many ways I think in spirit was influenced by that whole period that produced uh, uh, people like Peter and his friends, um, had to do with somehow learning how to work as, as anarchist work, but somehow towards a common goal uh, in the pursuit of, of ideas uh, manifesting themselves in architecture. The, uh, the important thing I think uh, uh, for me, that's most evident in the work then, and especially the work now, is still the pursuit of ideas. Um, and I think that the the uh, um, the ideas I think are being uh, sort of transferred uh, around the world as as Peter and, and and Christine teach in many places and act somehow as sort of uh, empresarials for a whole community that's now emerging around the world that have similar ideas and are trying to um, work out those ideas through architecture. The one thing that I think will be evident when you look at the work, uh, besides the, the multitude of ideas that are in it, is the kind of fun that it seems to have been sort of uh, uh, produced uh, in. 
it, it, it sort of tends to look like spontaneous play, albeit it's very serious stuff. Um, it tends to question very fundamental values as well as very superficial ones. It, from the very beginning, it's been work that uh, somehow um, has forced all of us to confront uh, things that we took for granted, uh, from the way cities are made, uh, to the way people live, to the way buildings are made, and then ultimately how they're occupied. Um, the other thing that was, I think, uh, an important um, well, thing for all of us to understand was the nature of technology, the relationship between technology and society. Um, again, my generation was educated at a time when technology um, was really the, the, dominant, uh, the, the dominant force in the relationship. Um, whereas I think um, um, the English and particularly the Archogram group and currently um, and Peter and Christine show how uh, technology is truly the servant, um, that it isn't the, the, uh, the dominant part of the relationship, that technology serves people, um, but yet technology is a very important aspect of the current world. Um, I think we're, we're uh, quite fortunate to, to have both of them here to show, I'm sure, a, a lot of work that they produced over the last 10 years. And with that, um, I give you Christine and Peter. Could we have the first two slides on and the lights off, please? I think it's reasonable that architecture should be very weird. And I think it's reasonable that sometimes the reasons by which we arrive at certain architectural thoughts are weird. It's, it's difficult for us to give a very comprehensive introduction because I think that as has been suggested by the excellent lead-in that Michael gave, that there are many different ways of combining the forces, but both of different individuals and different circumstances and that many relevances are constantly in a state of cycle. Nonetheless, I think that architecture is also compounded of the obvious and mystery. Stonehenge is obviously a trabeated structure. We could, if we completed the model, if we made it like some of those reconstructions that you see in books, we could make it into an extremely boring and obvious object. And there are overtones of mystery that occur as soon as the thing is old, spooky, wrapped in hocus-pocus and druids and so forth. And I myself have a hankering after certain obviousness. A favorite object of mine, though I was too young to see it, was I think it's Bel Geddes's pavilion for general motors down at the Chicago exhibition, which is just simply the problem of entering and it's a beautiful icon, and terribly obvious. Michael touched upon Englishness, and there is that aspect of Englishness which, which moves from invention to the silly, and sometimes includes both invention and the silly. Our love of, of pitting situations to the breaking point is something that crops over and over again in English engineering, in English thinking, in English, vagaries of, of situations. And really, the slide on the left and the slide on the right, though they can't come both from the tradition of the serious and the silly, are about that same culture. And yet, <coughs> it is from mainland Europe that many of the inspirations come. And I deliberately take what is still a fairly contemporary building, the one on the right by Ludwig Leo in Berlin, is surely an inspiration to those of us who at the end of the archigram period had begun to move on to other things. And it hits you between the eyes very tellingly when you go to Berlin just after you had fell out of love with certain architectural propositions to see it actually done superbly. And I think this kind of uh, combat is important to be constantly not only questioning your own work but sometimes returning to see somebody doing what you have already passed on from and doing it so well that it re revivifies your 
faith in the proposition. Not only that, but of course, Leo's building is very much Chernikov's proposition for real. The other thing, though, against the heroism and the, the dogmatism that comes to us from mainland Europe is that English waftiness, pastoralness, waywardness, uh, lazy poeticness, which I shall return to later, perhaps shown in this Samuel Palmer etching. Architecture intrigues one from all directions. It is currently fashionable amongst our circles to discuss the hanging off architecture. I, I deliberately take an Australian example rather than an English one or an American. Uh, Rick Lepastria's house with the architecture falling off itself in a way that I doubt, doubt whether even Los Angeles could bring itself to do. But at the same time as having a, a taste and intrigue for such things, one returns to some of the old heavies, and I mean that in, in, in many senses, such as Poltzig, who made very special spaces full of brooding cynicism and at the same time finesse. Two totally different worlds. How on earth can one like both, you might ask? <coughs> and the object itself. Again, the rhetoric that now, in a very powerful way, comes from such places as Tokyo. I think that there are more exciting buildings in Tokyo coming out of the drawing boards than any other place. And the outrageousness of something like uh, Katagawa's cinema is an outrageousness that I doubt whether we could ever bring ourselves to do, even if we had the wood wool and the aluminum available. And rhetorical outrageousness, of course, is something that one has a love-hate relationship to. And so if we are not careful, we retreat behind that British understatement. I will warn you of understated British objects, such as the one on the left. The little garden seat at Rausham looks simple, small. It is only made of wood. But if you look at it and think about it, you realize that it also contains a tremendous arrogance. Only a person of great culture, discrimination, power, and at least three miles of land owned by the same person in front of it could be sitting there. And I warn you of this aspect of our psychology, which does, from time to time, show through in the architecture. <coughs> Directly from that, then, a syndrome which also staying for a moment on this, this uh, theme of Englishness, besets one. I was taught by a generation of English architects, including the Smithsons, who started to use, started to lay their urban architecture upon a methodology which involved the wandering line. Influenced by that scheme, also were my friends Ron Heron and Warren Chalk on the South Bank. This notion of the wandering line, I think, has much <coughs> association with the English literary method. Compare, if you will, the difference between a typical English play or storyline of a novel, which, unlike its German or French counterpart, will not ha necessarily have heroes or villains or evil deeds or a polemic, but will wander gently past a series of episodes perhaps not suggesting a, even a particular staging post in the story. But as you move through the play or the book, you will acquire some sniff of, of the territory, of the atmosphere. You will discover that the villains have good things about them, and the heroes have feet of clay. And I think that the linear armature is something which crops over and over again, particularly in our larger project. The first project, in fact, that Chris and I worked jointly on was the one on the left, which itself was concerned with the explosion that occurs when two very different linear paths uh, coincide. It was the intersection house for the then um, Japanese competition judged by Richard Meyer. A little later, a linear path suggested for a piece of Stuttgart deliberately passes by a series of 
national icon, Stuttgart being a city with many art workers. It passes the Greek Orthodox Church, the British pub, the Italian pasta restaurant, and at the same time changes the mood of its architecture, but essentially is wayward. In a very recent project for Kawasaki, an information city which I shall return to, the notion of paths that sometimes are physically there and can be walked upon and cycled upon and beamed across is overlaid with the notion of unseen paths, but the occurrence of recognizable objects laying around those paths. The path then is an, a starting point and sometimes a point for actual something slightly more vicious, an actual dynamic uh, violation of the space itself in, in a project for a museum using an old church and 50% new building. The mode of arriving at the building, piercing through it, and moving up and around its space is deliberately both linear but also aggressive. And it bursts through into that space, setting up only then as a residual aspect the means by which this movement is in fact a theatrical progress. The, the museum objects which are dangled in amongst the movement are seen not only once, not only twice, but several times and in several different angles and dimensions as one aggressively moves into that space. This, the, the, the theme crops up again and again in the DOM offices which Chris and I did with Ron Heron, a, the linear pattern which you see here the path in yellow moves, as it were, like the, the river at the bed of the valley. The river rarely staying exactly in the center of the bed of the valley, but playing a kind of slightly, slightly nervous game with it and turning up and into the gradually intensifying landscape created by the office building itself. In the more recent scheme, which Christine will describe in more detail, the Langen Museum on the right, the path again moving up, ever upwards through space and turning at certain key moments presents you not the exhibits full frontally, but gradually emerging. And I think there is also in our work not only this, this uh, winding path syndrome, but also, I suppose, a, a tantalization for the Gothic presentation of phenomena rather than the classic, rather than the expected, the to be discovered. Sometimes the line is not the link upon which you can move, but a kind of love-hate barrier in this piece of the Arcadia city. The line, the main line, is actually the wall that prevents you from immediately seeing the private part of the housing scheme though the minor walls actually give you access. So that here the, the core is both a marker for the scheme, but also a barrier. And I'm intrigued when Dagmar Richter, one of my recent uh, German students, takes again on the right the wall as the generator for a long piece of castle city, which gradually metamorphoses Though the wall continues, the actual building itself begins to change around it. The wall, in a sense, in both these cases, they're not exactly as a passive element, but as a kind of uh, marker. And in the Trondheim Library, Christine and I again use the winding path as perhaps a piece of, of linear sanity around which and down from which can emerge the undulation of the building proper. I have to say that uh, both Trondheim Library and the Intersection House, I think for both of us, contained certain ideas that have been reiterated over the last 10 or 12 years that we've worked together. I also have to say that Trondheim for us was particularly important. Uh, it achieved the 
singular distinction of getting on Norwegian television uh, because it was the most universally disliked entry in the competition. And when we saw what won the competition, we were absolutely delighted and even more pleased with our uh, proposal. And I think we were sort of resolved to like it even more. However, there are other ideas apart from the path which are germane to later conversations. And one of these was a preoccupation with landscape. Uh, the subject of landscape, I think, in more recent work, has become much more abstracted. But in Trondheim Library, we were trying to make direct reference to the very dramatic landscape that exists uh, in this particular part of Norway. I have to also admit that the slide on the left is a cheat. It's not Norway, it's China, but it's quite similar. Um, we had the controlling armature of the park, which wrapped its way around the main proportion of the site, and we were left with a very large internal volume, which somehow we wanted to make reference to the indigenous landscape. And we did this by observing some of the hierarchy that exists in natural landscape, and also some of the implicit order and try to transpose that into the central volume, which contained the main lending library. Also, subsidiary references were made by the use of rocky outcrops, which you can see in the slide on the right, hanging off the main structure, which supported the route. And these rocky outcrops contained a lot of the ancillary departments of the library, and also the departments that needed to be acoustically controlled. Another conversation that stems from Trondheim was a conversation about layers, a conversation about ambiguity, a conversation about giving a hint of what the building contains and what the building does. And the slide on the right-hand side is, side is very well known. It's Sharrow House. And what we attempted to do was to enclose the building with a skin of glass brick, which varied in uh, levels of opacity and translucency. This was also uh, a conversation and an idea that stemmed from the levels of light, which uh, are a feature of these northerly latitudes, and the fact that for very significant months of the year, Trondheim was going to be in darkness, and therefore the main body of the library was going to be illuminated. And it gave us an opportunity to create shadow play, if you like, uh, within the building. Another idea, much more mundane, was to do with the way that we had to subdivide the main interior space. And having created a volume which was very large and fairly dramatic, we were very reluctant to subdivide it in a totally orthodox manner, i.e. using partitions that were solid. So we took some inspiration, I suppose, from the method of construction of the external wall and decided to use an open framework metal mesh as one of the systems for giving visual subdivision within the main body of the library. And depending on whether they were used singly or overlaid, the level of opacity could be changed. And the idea of mesh, I think, uh, was used, certainly by me, in a later project and one which was, I suppose, partly inspired, inspired by conversations of Trondheim Library, partly inspired by uh, buildings such as the SOM Bank that exists and the Tangley construction, which has always intrigued me because I never really know whether, in fact, it's art or architecture. And so there were a series of drawings called the mesh ground, where one takes the idea 
of a minimal structure uh, that is universal, that not only supports the building, but also encloses it. And so the structural mesh is the single device that creates the space. It was also prompted by reading some of Bartzman's comments about the catenary cables of Brooklyn Bridge, where he said that the cables were the most specific definition of three-dimensional space and far more precise than traditional walls or windows. Whoops. And also inspired by Bartzman's universal link, the idea of endlessness, the idea of an almost continuous space, the idea of a structural device which when its matrix is changed and when the interval of the structure is changed, it can give one uh, a method of varying the degrees of opacity, of varying the degrees of translucency, of varying the, the degrees of publicness and privateness. Uh, that this sort of enclosure ca has to offer. Now let's see what I can <coughs> And ah, I'm out of sync. Right, I'm back in sync again. Just after having done Trondheim and also the meshed ground. I did a project for an interior of a hotel lounge and it was also concerned with ways in which you could define space or demarcate space using as little solid matter as possible. And so I combined the idea of using light and reflection and metal mesh in the ways that one could uh, demarcate certain areas for seating, certain areas for drinking, and certain areas for standing around. But when I look at the slide on the left-hand side, I realize that light and reflection uh, exist far more satisfactorily and far more dramatically in nature than they do in an architectural rendition. Light and mesh came together in a project that Peter and I did at Linz about eight years ago. And we were asked to do design an exhibition stand which was to do with the theme of speed, time and information. I'm not sure that this exhibition stand has got anything to do with speed, time and information. I think it was merely uh, a demonstration of our preoccupations with light, uh, of layering, uh, of using semi-translucent substance. But when the thing was constructed, they seemed to be reasonably happy with it. In a more architectural context, uh, mesh and layers and light are used in this project that we did for the peak in Hong Kong. And the project is simply a series of enclosures, a series of boxes that are tucked into the hillside. And the main piece, the, the focal point of the project, in fact was the back side of the building. But the back side of the building overlooked a very dramatic view down onto the top surface of Hong Kong. And in fact, it was the back side of the building which was going to be the main figure that one could see from the town. And so some of the structure and some of the external balustrading is illuminated by light. And a series of overlapping metal meshes are used as screening devices uh, over each of the balconies. This is the 
front stroke back elevation of the apartment block, which was one of the prerequisites of the composition, com competition. And two houses done almost together, also to do with light, to do with armature, uh, to do with using substance which is uh, minimal and also to do with using substance which casts shadow. But the basis of both projects is completely different. On the right-hand side, there's a scheme that we did which was the result of winning a competition for a solar house in a part of Germany called Landstuhl. And on the right-hand side, uh, a far more abstracted version of the house, or a house, called the Shadow House, which I shall describe later. So this was the site for the Blue House. It stood on a very spectacular setting, on the edge of a disused stone quarry, overlooking the fairly small town of Langstall. Slide on the right-hand side is a collage of the house on site. The house is really quite schizophrenic. It's a house of two parts. Two parts because the nature of the landscape and the nature of the views on either side of the site were dramatically different. And also a house of two parts because the environmental system used demanded that we should absorb as much light as we could on the south side and keep as much heat in as we could on the north side. And this is a view of the south elevation which has um, a view over the town which you can see on the, left -hand, the right hand side. And it is a fairly large expanse of glass which is shielded uh, at certain times of the day and also shielded at night as well. But for us, I think the most intriguing and potentially the most difficult part of the house was the north elevation. Because there was a necessity to keep in as much heat as possible, we were faced at one point with producing a completely monolithic facade, only punctuated occasionally by uh, windows to the bedrooms and bathrooms and of course the front door and we decided that we would articulate this north facade by using a narrative that was somehow descriptive of the site and also descriptive of the environmental use of the house so we looked at the geometry of the site we also looked at the geometry of the plan of the, of the house and we collaged both of them together and transposed that onto the facade. And the transposition was worked up as a bar-relief concrete render so that when the sun shone on the house, the shadows were either exaggerated and distended or completely shrunken, giving some kinetic quality to the north facade, acting, I suppose, not quite like a sundial, but it was, to, it, was, um, it was a device that was to say something about how the house was used or how the house was designed environmentally. The shadow house was, I suppose, a direct corollary um, of working on the blue house, where one had a very prescribed set of conditions. One had a very prescribed set of conditions because the client required a certain arrangement. Also, there were a very prescribed set of conditions because we had to satisfy a certain level of environmental control. And so what intrigued me was to question, I suppose, the orthodox hierarchy that one uh, automatically understands when you walk into a private domestic dwelling in the sense that you always go in through a front door, you come into a semi-public space which is either a hall or a living area. And as you proceed through the house, the space becomes more private 
and as you proceed up the house, the space becomes more private. And so this is a house which exists equally on either side of a spinal armature, which again is a reference back to Trondheim Library. On the right-hand side are the public spaces, which move up in echelon, and on the left-hand side are the private spaces, which move up in echelon. And what characterizes them is not their position relative to one another, but the way in which they're defined. Two slides showing the main entrance space uh, and the bridge over which you have to cross to get into the main body of the house. And the private and public spaces in more detail. On the left-hand slide, the private spaces, which are a sequence of rooms that finally lead into a bedroom, that are enclosed by fairly substantial mass. And the spaces are articulated only by very narrow shafts of light that come through small apertures in the wall. Conversely, on the public side of the house, which is the slide on the right-hand side, the public spaces are merely a series of platforms with as little physical intervention as possible. And the delineation is largely achieved by light shining on fairly frugal structure, which then casts shadows uh, over the floor areas. And what was intriguing, and I suppose false about the scheme, was that it was a series of ideas which were to do with insubstantial substance, which was really only worked out graphically. And so the obvious conclusion of that was to build a model and to actually test some of the ideas that were established on paper. And I think that what was exciting for both of us is that we built a model of the front part of the house and it looked absolutely nothing like the drawings at all. I mean, what we'd created was a completely different scheme. And so the, th the theories that we had uh, proposed on paper, uh, I think, really fell flat when we built the model. But what we got was a completely different project. A project that I did, um, I suppose about six or seven years ago, was one done in parallel with a group of students. And I don't think it's anything that I'm going to do again, because the results are often very embarrassing. And I asked the students to redesign uh, a building called Porchester Baths, which uh, exists in the Bayswater area of London. And it was uh, a late 19th century and early 20th century public bath. And in many ways, these sorts of buildings are an anachronism in the latter part of the 20th century. And without going into the details of the brief, in summary, one was asking them to design a public bathhouse which had more relevance to the way that one leads one's life in the, the then 1970s. And so I used it as an excuse to explore certain ideas and preoccupations that I had at the time. And so there is a plan of the bath which uses water as a very positive design tool. Again, going back to the notion of armature and the idea that armature is a very central and very important controlling factor in our design. The armature in this case was water, a series of water channels which led one round the building. It was also uh, a substance which was used for reflection. It was used to orally control certain, or acoustically control certain areas. Uh, it also was used in conjunction with certain notions about structure and about repetitive structure and how one could overlay structure of certain intervals on top of one another in order to create screening 
And again, that goes back to Trondheim. And again, it goes back to the meshed ground. And it was concerned with enclosing space, with water that ran down glass, water that was chilled, water that condensed onto glass surfaces. And so there was a very minimal use of solid structure and an attempt to create as many levels of translucency and ambiguity in the building. And I suppose one can't help making analogies between the building and the pier. I think that we proceed also by enjoying these analogies and ambiguities, and sometimes quite fundamental ambiguities. I think that any architect of the 20th century has been bombarded with and has experienced the city, not only bombarded with the idea of the city as a sort of architectural uh, core notion, but also with the fact that the 95% of architects operating in the Western world are operating out of cities, or at least sub-city situations that, that have the apparatus uh, of living in a city, even though they are sometimes pretend villages or pretend suburbs. And one can see that even contemporary students, a student piece from one of my Frankfurt students on the right, done only half a year ago, or a year ago, is still in love, it would seem, and it wasn't my doing, <laughs> still in love with many of the, the, the buzzes that perhaps I myself got 20 years ago when making the plug-in city. The idea of intensity, the idea of things happening. And then I myself went through a kind of love-hate relationship that deliberately wanted to make city structures that were anti-city. The notion of the city as a disappearing act. The notion of the city, as in the slide on the right, of the instant city, the city merely uh, to, to make a paradigm of, of, of Warhol's instant success, um, the instant city coming to your village and making your village a metropolis for a moment or a week and then moving on like the circus. And of course in England we have a long tradition of this love-hate relationship to the city. Well in Garden City on the left, pretending that it was some kind of uh, late medieval village where nice people would do nice things behind nice hedges. And the disintegrative city on the left, the core part of the Arcadia city, took the most pompous uh, and the most intense part of the thing, the, the rooms where the mayor and the city council would work, itself metamorphosing through small businesses, two-man businesses, one-man businesses, a barn for selling things, and finally the guy selling shoelaces on a trestle table. The thing metamorphosing from one state to the next. But in the same project, I couldn't help myself but then take something nearly approaching with the kind of idealized dream city, the ivory towers, where the most romantic dreamers would have their apartments and fish in the river and grow their vegetables hydroponically. Uh, or in another part of the same project, a, a deliberate forcing of the most obtuse aspects of city life, noise, hard materials, tough people, inspired in fact from Soho in New York, a metal building, but then as one moved along the building, disintegrating into the, the kind of gentle suburbia. But no dividing line between the two. In, in, in other words, fascinated by the notion of the city that can contain extremes and then proposing a series of buildings that can enhance and extremize those, those extremes. The Times newspaper of London were foolish enough to ask me to make a project about South London. This is something upon which Christine and I have a, a constant argument. She lives in South London. I live in North London, and never the twain shall meet. Uh, my response 
was to say that the particular part of South London they asked me to comment on was so bloody awful that it should be flooded. Um, and flooded, flooded, I did, at least on paper. And we have the extraordinary then situation. In fact, inspired by Tokyo, because at the core of Tokyo are the Imperial Palace Gardens, which I believe are only open to the public one time a year, and which then act as a negative focus, the hole in the donut, the hole in the polo mint, around which the, the sub-central parts of the city can exist. And my proposition was that should this lake be made in the crotch of the river, then a, a South London could re-establish itself, which would be of equal heroism to North London. It was merely a proposal in a newspaper, and there were many angry letters written to the same newspaper, which at least for them was good copy. Another proposition was, in fact, following on from that conversation that Christine made about layers, taking the notion of composition by layering to an urban design or even a, a metropolitan design scale, proceeding by setting up pieces of the layered collage and then scribbling and re reassembling, and eventually ending up with a master plan, if you like, which is concerned with linear paths challenging each other and challenging also the series of watercourses that fall down the, the sides of the Oslo Fjord. And the actual parts of that city moving from the gentle to the extremely heroic. Only when you move into the fjord itself do you get the most heroic parts of the city. And going over ground, one used the, uh, the shadow half, which we see here in section, as a starting point for describing the, the format of the city, the back of the city, the water falling past and through the shadow house, down series of waterfalls, encircling series of, of revolving apartment blocks and office blocks and villas, and falling down, down, down through more and more layers. Sometimes the layers of building, sometimes the layers of trees, sometimes the layers of controlled paths of trees. The plan here, pieces of shadow house, the various paths and layers. And sometimes, of course, that, that love-hate which one has between the ambiguous and the gentle and the, the wayward and deliberate explosion. I don't call it heroism, but sort of almost heroic anti-heroism that, that one felt was a necessary adjunct to the same scheme on the right. Sometime later, I forced this, this uh, question of what could the city be into describing a vocabulary for possible city buildings. And I, I did a a trick that I've done probably once every eight years, which is to, to draw out a series of parts, if you like, a, a, a kit of, of stylistic and, and typological elements, and then gradually, having, having drawn them, to begin to compose them towards the ultimate end, which of course will be a, an interdependence between those parts. So deliberately, if I just go back again, some of the parts are extremely bland, pieces of standard air-conditioned office block stroke hotel, general purpose space, and sometimes quite the opposite, a, a sort of deliberately knitted and, and specific and specialized, almost hugging your leg like a sock architecture. And a vegetable architecture, a theme that I'll come to at the end. And then beginning to, and, and a mechanized and electricalized architecture, and gradually knitting them together. The, the collage begins to suggest a, a mixture of them all, which again I will come to uh, when I talk about the real city. You will see that the real city project, in fact, comes out of this, which is an a priori definition of, of type. And then I start to look at cities which I have visited, and, and I've started a, a habit which I shall probably extend to this city, which I begin to know and love, um, but Brisbane, which I love less. Nonetheless, I was there for five weeks. And 
I did something similar to, to what Chris has described with the Porchester Bars. I actually did the project which I had set the students myself, this dangerous thing. And we took the patch of green that you see in the foreground there. Brisbane, the city with a large river, a very ordinary downtown, and long, sprawling suburbs which contain um, the inventive aspects of colonialism in the hot climate. The importation of metalwork, layering for the needs of layering because it's a hot, sticky climate and has lots of bugs in it. And the keeping away from the bugs and the layering of the verandas of the bungalows gave me inspiration to suggest that on this side of the river you could extend the downtown but with a tower type that would be in a sense indigenous. It would be built up of a series of veranda layered bungalows as housing, except that they would also rise into the sky. And that the river itself could be fanned, the breezes could be fanned by the laying of fans which themselves are small foot bridges linking the two sides. And then you might, from time to time, contrast it with an extremely sleek and abstracted and highly air-conditioned office type as well. Another city which I, I, of which I'm very fond is Oslo. And it was semi-conscious, semi-subconscious uh, in the way that uh, as a consultant to an architectural firm there, I did a, a, a project for an office block which incorporates the tower, of which there are almost none in Oslo and are much needed, uh, with the, the tradition of the five or six story European street condition, which one finds particularly in northern cities. The scheme developed then into other territories. It took on board certain overtones of the Nordic dragon style. It took on board certain notions of layering and meshing and, and tenting and pieces that come and pieces that go. And then a later exercise into the same city, into Oslo, recognize that in a dark climate with cheap electricity and particularly in the period around the 1920s the lantern becomes a very very important not only an important icon of, of light but actually important model for working on if one was proposing a series of towers this series of towers uses the very small lantern which can then be seen as an analog for the larger lanterns, which of course is in the tradition of the bay window, and the Nords love to rush to the bay window, as soon as there's the hint of sun or the hint of a ship coming in. And then the extrapolation of the bay window to the total bay as an apartment, also looking out to sea, as it were. And then finally, the, t the whole tower itself as a lantern. And so, needless to say, these are called the lantern towers, the small lanterns the larger, the larger, the whole tower is a lantern. And inevitably one must discuss it as a nighttime building and as a midnight sun building, as well as a normal full frontal building seen during the daytime. To move to Frankfurt on the left, where all the discussions about bringing in more artists lead one to say, but where are they going to be? And proposing a tower of studios which is deliberately formed in contradistinction to the many rather commercial towers that one has in Frankfurt. And on the right, to take London, a damp city, and to deliberately enjoy the damp and to deliberately make a piece of architecture that can encourage the damp and have its walls allowing the moss to creep up from the garden and to place a garden which droops and hangs down in the dampness, down the sides of the building. And then the tower and the city taking an abstraction, because as, a, as, a, as a, an enjoyer of symphonic music since a child, I began to feel and notice that the structuring of a symphony has many overtones of urban design and of the many, many layers of composition that perhaps this layered approach to the city might have. And so I then did the rather simple experiment of taking a piece of music and extrapolating it as an arrangement, a very simple arrangement of city. The notes as towers, the staves as streets, the bar markings 
as bridges. And what was the irony of the thing, the space between the staves, uh, which in fact is, is unimportant to the actual statement of the music, became, I suspect, the most interesting part of the composition. Another thing there. And one becomes preoccupied by this business of structuring and shift and layering. I was asked for the first time ever to design a piece of jewellery which is being made right now in, in Austria. And I made the thing that might fortunately or unfortunately dangle around some lady's neck, a piece of urban structuring. The, the baseline with its rivers, the first matrix perhaps of streets or decks or buildings, and then the buildings themselves shifting and running between. But sometimes one can actually say it all in much more, more oddest in much more modest objects, one doesn't necessarily need the statement of the city to talk about place and layering. Here is a proposition very much of an English type. Uh, it was part, I think it was exhibited here in Los Angeles at the Corcoran Gallery during the Follies exhibition. Uh, it started off in New York. And in my folly, the proposition is, of course, the, the mythical great country house with the very nice people sipping sherry on the terrace and saying to the hostess, oh my God, you've got a new little pavilion. How nice. I'm sure you can get a beautiful view of the sea from the top. She says, yes, you can. It's only if they bother, they go down to this little white tower to get their view of the sea. If they actually bothered to go inside it and not just make the polite word from the terrace, they discover that in fact you can, but you climb. You go in and suddenly you realize the thing is blue. And as you climb it becomes a more and more insistent and obsessive blue. It, it overtakes you and perhaps if you've got guts you climb on. And the whole apparatus of the, of the building becomes more and more wayward as you climb. The, the rails and the surroundings become more and more spooky. And then, eventually, you burst out from this obsessive blue, and yes, you get a view of the sea, which is what it was about. Berlin, by comparison, is fairly straight. And I think it's very important for us to say that although a lot of the work that one does is on the edge of reality, a lot of the work that one does is taken to a level of abstraction which seems fantastic or unreal, there are always vestiges of those abstracted ideas transposed back into projects which have a, a far more pragmatic background. And this is certainly one of them. We were invited two and a half years ago to take part in uh, the EBA in Berlin. And we were given a site on which to design uh, a block of apartments which can loosely be described as social housing. I don't know whether any equivalents exist in the States, but our English equivalent is local authority housing which means that it's part funded by the government and uh, as such conforms to extraordinarily stringent legislation, extraordinarily stringent uh, cost parameters uh, and also incredibly stringent spatial requirements. So Peter and I started off in a very cavalier and very naive fashion because the brief didn't stipulate how many apartments we were meant to accommodate on this site, which I believe is about 21 meters across and 12 or 15 meters deep. And we realized that the orientation of the site was quite important. It has an east-west orientation. It overlooks uh, a fairly major piece of public open space called Lutzerplatz. And it also then overlooks uh, a fairly major piece of public architecture by Ungers. Uh, and we 
first of all said, well, whatever happens, it just can't look like Ummuz, it can't be Germanic, and the spaces within the flat have got to be as generous as possible. And after our first attempt, we reread the brief and all of the legislative and building requirements again and came across something called the R factor. And we realized that we had to redesign the whole block because the R factor was going to determine our usable floor ratio to volume. And it meant that we were going to get apartments which were, by law, incredibly tiny. And we felt very strongly because we were also compelled to use uh, a through plan that ran, ran from the front to the back of the apartment that they should try and receive as much light as possible. So once we fully understood that we were going to do about 13 or 14 apartments which were going to be very, very tiny, very cramped and very dark, one of the main priorities was to give them as much light as possible and to try and give them a sense of space even though we weren't giving them actual space. And so the arrangements are quite simple. There are uh, two apartments on one side and one apartment on the other side of a central staircase. And the configuration of the apartments is, I suppose, uh, only slightly differentiated from a normal plan by the use of splayed walls in order to create a sense of false perspective. And as one moves up the building, uh, the amount of height, vertical height, that we give to each of the flats uh, begins to gradually increase. I can't remember how many hours or days or weeks we spent over a calculator making sure that the areas and volumes of these spaces were absolutely correct. We had to do this because we realized that in order to give some of the apartments more vertical height than was allowed, we would have to borrow that space from elsewhere in the building, which was mainly the, the public areas. And so there are three apartments which have uh, much greater vertical thrust than the rest. They also create um, a sense of verticality, particularly on the front. And also we borrow some space from the undercroft of the rounded roof. On the back side of the building, which is the slide on the left-hand side, we pay a certain lip service to Germanic order. But on the front side of the building, which is the main facade that overlooks Lutzerplatz and which also overlooks the Ungers building, we try and be um, a little less Germanic, I suppose, a little less ordered, and also try and emphasize the verticality of the flats and try and de-emphasize the sort of rather rel relentless horizontality that seems to be uh, a distinguishing feature of most German buildings. And when we did this facade, we said to each other, well, they just won't buy it. They will absolutely hate it. But to our enormous surprise, they didn't hate it. And the thing is going to be constructed at the beginning of next year. One moves on from Berlin to Frankfurt. I have been the guest, more than tolerated, I hope, of Frankfurt now for two and a half years as its architecture professor. And I think that, that I should say that uh, Christine has just been referring to the sort of Germanicness of, of approach and of discipline of buildings. I think, on the other hand, there is an, an intriguing thing that I begin to conclude from two and a half years, which is that they are instinctively not as uptight as they come across. They have just difficulty in, in loosening. And certainly one can say that of Frankfurt. There is a curious thing in the physiognomy of Frankfurt, which if you look at the plan formation of it, it's very similar 
to a wayward English city. And that's because it was never the seat of a great king or prince. It was a, a city where trade was done and people acted <clears throat> to make a quick buck or its equivalent and just did things rather circumstantially. And so, like Topsy, it just grew. And that is very much the characteristic of, of the sort of casual way in which English cities grow. I find that curious. Um, there is, of course, in, in present-day Frankfurt, also the contrast that you find either side of the river mine. One side of the river, you see in the slide on the right, is busy trying to make it look as much like an American downtown as possible. And the other side of the river is trying to take advantage of the slightly more gentle atmosphere of the rich villas where the bourgeoisie, I suspect, in the end of the 19th century were able to sit listening to Schumann on the piano and smoking a fat cigar and watching the other side of the, ri of the river make the money for them. Uh, these villas have now been infiltrated by Richard Meyer, Matthias Unger, uh, Mr. Banish and others in order to form the museum mile. But to take the city as a whole, I have been fascinated by the way in which the main part of Frankfurt, which is only about 600,000 people, is surrounded by vast, a, a, a sort of Dalmatian's coat of small towns, usually ending up in the, the word Heim, uh, which means home, I believe, and also surrounded by large pieces of pickled forest. And in my real city project, I'm concerned with suggesting that Frankfurt, if it really wants the, the cosmopolitanism and its benefits, that it claims with its museum mile and its various cultural activities, then it's got to turn itself into some sort of real city. And what I'm looking at is the tradition, to start off with, of avenues. Now these hymns, a very grotty photograph on the right, but I took it about a week ago from an aeroplane. Uh, these hymns, as you can see, are little pocket pieces of metropolis, uh, quite high density, surrounded by woods. And there are lots of them. My first instinct is to do some kind of action that joins some of them together uh, in an intense way, and to perhaps use towers, which are very much in the tradition of old Frankfurt. You find these marker towers, which were originally for defensive purposes, running between. I'm also interested in the characteristic of the avenue, and my avenues are not necessarily tree-lined, but use the, the syncopation of the characteristic of the avenue which presents between the, the metaphorical trees depths, endless depths of space, the, the syncopation acting as the marker for the root, the gaps acting as the hint and the opening of the space outside. The map on the right is of the, my first two probes at this linking process. You can see two rows of what I call villas with the syncopation of the avenue, linking um, Offenbach on the right, which is just a very large hind, uh, with um, Oberad on the left, which is a village entirely surrounded by, by suburb. And I start off with a proposition for these villas, which I call the gut or hulk, which some of you saw as my... Uh, Los Angeles prize entry. And the gut or help is made of as found materials. Cheap cement slurry, things that you can find around, old bits of readers, cars, and bits of logs of wood, made into great big humps of usable space for fireproof corridors and elevator conditions. And maybe they can stay there forever. Maybe they can stay there till somebody knows what to do with them. Or maybe they can be minimally interpreted. Maybe they can have casual situations moving in onto them over a period of time. Or maybe the situations that move onto them are quite intense and are, for instance, a piece of layered housing. So many layers, so many individualized layers of the apartments that you can hardly now see the gut or the hulk on the right-hand side. Or perhaps a kind of mixture of real avenue and gut Hulk Avenue can mix with 
a roughly 50-50 development of the park up into the building, as in the London Tower, and the apartments down into the, into the trees. Or perhaps the guts and the hulk, which you can still see lurking in the slide on the right, can have a wilder, more free-form interpretation. We change trays here and continue on the subject of what can happen to the gut and the hull. I think that it is fascinating to be confronted intensely with a new city. I think that because I've been in London for so long, I don't sort of look at it anymore. Whereas Frankfurt, I'm still looking at it with wide open eyes, loving it and hating it, and still very energetically wanting to, to say something back to it. And <coughs> the marker towers that occur at the changes of direction of the avenues can take many forms too. They can take the form of alternative housing towers. And if you were looking carefully at the uh, city that was based upon the musical score, you will have noticed some towers that were bugged by these strange blotches. I, I developed the blotch, the, the blotch bug idea, the notion being that you could bug the facade of your apartment by renting additional pictorial effects, electronic pictorial effects. So you don't just have to look out onto the rest of Frankfurt or onto what is across the street. You can actually condition it by something allied, let us say, to cable television, but the television becomes your window. This is something I'd like to develop on another project or at a later or a more detailed stage. Other alternative marker towers use what is existing on the ground. There is a weather station at Offenbach, which I then use to suggest a weather, a weather measuring tower, which can be one of the turning points. The plan on the right shows some of the detail of this intersection of, of villas, as I call them, and backyard shed with Offenbach. A detail here. And moving to then another piece of Frankfurt which I look at, which is the, the uh, dock, the West Harbour, which occurs on the river Mine, and which has somewhat lost its, its uh, relevance to the present day pattern of trading. And is a marvelous site, which again, one has encouraged students to look at, and then one couldn't resist looking at it oneself. In this case, a major structure, which perhaps, dare I say it, suggests that I haven't totally fallen out of love with what happens if you straddle space and then dangle from it. But I think unlike the plug-in city, the operation is perhaps much less consistent and perhaps is in detail much more dynamic, I would hope so. I would hope that this park come museum, come hotel, come just zoo place to go and catch the breeze. I think catching the breeze in large cities is something which we don't design enough for. Is taken on board. Christine, Ron Heron, and I, last year, made a study for a piece of Hamburg Riverside in a one-week symposium. And this is a little piece of our project on the right. As children of the river and the seaside, all three of us spent our youth by the water in different places. And we in instinctively, therefore, bring this to bear on an infiltrationary structure into a German city. The West Haven in Frankfurt, on the left, is, I think, waiting for such an intervention. And we ourselves have been invited into another competition in Hamburg, where we will, in fact, take up where we left off with that project on the right. So it's something that's very much in one's mind right now. The joining of space in the air, landing on peninsulas and islands, the making of these macro structures, not as complete things, but as armatures, rather like the layers and meshes again, that anticipate events rather than make them fully complete. We're back to Germany again. And a more recent 
proposal that Peter and I were involved in, which was to design a museum for contemporary stained glass in a village called Lange, which is a dormitory suburb of Frankfurt. And we were invited by the town council and also a man called Johannes Schweiter, who is a colleague of Peter's, and also one of Germany's foremost stained glass artists. And I think that we were inspired partly by his work, which the museum is largely going to house. It already has a collection of his work, which they uh, don't have enough space to exhibit. But it was to be a static collection of his work uh, and also work from other selected contemporary stained glass artists. But the problem for us was the fact that Langham has um, a very much loved medieval centre. And we were given a site which was a real hot potato. It was the old centre of Langham. It had uh, a Gothic church, a 19th century town hall. It had certain pieces of medieval structure. It had medieval road patterns. It had buildings from the 50s straddling the back of the site. And I think that it's terribly important to understand that the architectural heritage that one has in Europe, which goes back hundreds and hundreds of years, is almost, almost always obsessively preserved and um, manically retained. And any horrific piece of modern architecture which is uh, imposed on these uh, sanctuary-like sites is almost inevitably going to be disliked. And so we were left with this extraordinary situation of being asked to design a very small museum to house contemporary work in one of the oldest parts of this small village and on a site that everybody, or in an area that everybody loved and everybody wanted to preserve. And we knew that the only thing that they were going to want to see there was some sort of imitative copy of any one of the buildings around. And rather than be totally bloody-minded, we took the issue of contextualism very seriously. And what we immediately rejected was any idea of making a parody or a metaphor of some of the surrounding buildings. For one thing, Historically, they spanned a very substantial period of time. Stylistically, they were enormously eclectic. In terms of volume and height, there was no uh, consistency whatsoever. And also, the geometry of the site was very extraordinary. And the geometry of the main piece of public open space, which you can see on the left-hand slide at the top of the building, was also quite irregular. So we looked at some of the early medieval plans and we looked at some of the 19th century plans and we actually looked at the site as it was or as it is today. And we determined first of all the main routes, the main methods of approach to the site. We looked at the main vehicular route into the town which runs at right angles to our facade. And we looked at the, the main pedestrian route which runs parallel to our facade. And the siting of the building was absolutely crucial. There was no obvious way that it could be rotated to address either an obvious part of the site or an obvious direction in which people would arrive at the building. And so we really took our clue from the previous siting of the building that existed on that site uh, beforehand. And we tilted the building towards the main incoming route, but projected part of the structure over the pedestrian route so that there were visual links in two directions, and also tilted the building, I suppose, towards the most dominant structure within the square. 
It's a building which is incredibly simple in plan. It again uses an armature, rather like Tron Time, as the main controlling and organisational device. And the central route, which is in fact a ramp, splits the building in two. And on either side of the ramp are the main exhibition spaces. We were very disappointed when we learned from Johanna Schreiter that, in fact, most of the contemporary stained glass which is produced today are produced as autonomous art pieces and they're not to be included in the architecture. And so we had the task of designing two basically light-type boxes within which the uh, pieces of glass were going to be displayed. So on one side of the ramp, there is a large volume which is going to contain a rotating exhibition and on the other side two lesser volumes which are going to contain the permanent exhibition. The route then uh, emerges from the bifurcated display space and wraps its way or threads its way through uh, the ancillary spaces of the museum which one can explain rather more clearly using these diagrams. Starting at the lowest level, um, there are two public spaces, one of which is a beer keller and the other uh, a youth club, which I think was uh, needed in order to salve the town's conscience. At the back end of the site, partially submerged in the ground, are many of the service spaces. And also I think that it's useful to point out using these forms that there is a line of structure that emerges from the back part of the building out into open space. And this is not only structure that supports the back of the building but also is the first line of support for a temporary tent which uh, was an immensely important requirement in the scheme as they have something called an apple wine festival that needs to be covered for three weeks of the year. Moving up the building, one can still see uh, the galleries clearly in evidence on either side of the route. And in the yellow plan, the restaurant space, and on the upper plan, the administrative space. The nature of the front and the back part of the building are quite distinct both in material and also figurative character. The front part of the building uh, is essentially simple because of its functional requirements both in plan uh, and also in cladding and also in the sense that we wanted to have a fairly mute building to face um, a very eclectic piece of public open space. The back side of the site, which at the moment is a car park, faces um, a far more random and far less precious uh, series of structures, most of which have their back side facing towards us. And so the building becomes slightly more wayward. It becomes slightly less controlled and serves as a counterpoint to the front portion. And these two drawings show the building in section which shows the galleries fairly clearly and also the top level of the building which has a roof space which dips down towards the uh, roof line or the eaves line of the adjacent town hall. And Although there was no uh, readily identifiable height to correspond to, we felt that it was important to make some acknowledgement um, of the volumes and the height principles set certainly by the nearest building and the building, in fact, into which we have to link. So a photograph of the model showing a side view of the building showing the, uh, the method of cladding the front part of the building and also the slightly open structure of the back part. The other 
the other aspect of the scheme, which I suppose is quite important, was the use of glass itself. And the only opportunity that we had to use that uh, architecturally as a main feature of the external surface of the building was really on the part that hung out at the back that contained the restaurant and administrative space, as the rest had to be completely light tight. And uh, a <coughs> elevation of the back part of the building and a photograph of the same side of the building uh, in model form with the roof taken off, I hasten to add. It doesn't actually look like that. And a photograph of the model of the building, again with the roof taken off, which I think fairly clearly shows the organizational pattern but it also shows another element of the building, which for us was particularly important. The central ramp that uh, bifurcates the exhibition space uh, is also paralleled at high level by a gantry structure onto which a cradle is hung, uh, which is needed to lift some of the larger installations into the gallery level. And it is the extension of that gantry system that acts as a signpost on the front part of the building. The front facade of the building showing the central entrance, the ramp that rises up to the foyer level and restaurant level and then subsequently winds its way through the back part of the building. The other aspect of the building which we enjoyed making was the ramp itself and we felt that because the museum was to house glass that glass was essentially a very critical material to use and we had I suppose a fairly flippant conversation at one point which was if the ramp is very important as a carrier of people also very important as an organizational device, then why don't we make the ramp out of glass? And we had that conversation, which was instantly dismissed, because we thought that it was far too impractical. And the engineer who was working with us on this, a man called Peter Rice, um, who was the main engineer on the Pompidou Center, said after we'd mentioned this idea to him, oh, no, you... That's absolutely fine. Of course you can use glass on the ramp. I've just built one in Paris. And so we have a glass ramp that takes you through a glass museum. The other, the other aspect of the facade and two subsequent points within the building, which I think is also worth mentioning, is that we have tried to keep the facade as the front facade as minimal as possible and the extension of the gantry at high level provides a support for a piece of stained glass which is hung from it and then a light from the other side of the road is shone through the stained glass and the reflection of the stained glass is then the uh, only way that the front facade of the building is animated. Another museum building for Frankfurt is for a competition extending the existing art museum and is of particular interest to me because I work out of the building behind. It's the old German system where the academy sits behind the garden, the museum sits in front of the garden, the river sits in front of the museum and the city sits in front of the river. And of course in their wisdom, the city fathers have decided to take the best piece of the garden and propose to screw it up with an extension of the museum. Many of the topics that we've discussed already, the notion of the linear path, of a certain amount of sort of gothic perceiving of things, crops up in this. But it's probably one of the simplest of our projects. The idea is to contrast 
something like a keyhole situation, the, 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 the narrow, the sort of almost secret view space with the full frontality of paintings laid upon white walls. And so a series of these keyhole conditions might suggest no one is in a completely contained box again, might suggest a hint of a view of what's going on outside the museum and the park. One walks along, and there's another hint of a view of some very special chambers. As you move further along, the hint of the view of the chamber reveals that there might be something rather special in this chamber. And when you're bored with all of that, you walk along, and there's a further hint of the view that it doesn't matter because there's a, a garden around you anyway, and you can soon escape. One's English Gothic instincts are towards the hint and the suggestion of the place beyond. Through the aperture in the screen is possibly a special place if you were to move through into it. And about, and around, and you move down the aisle and perhaps you will discover, and then perhaps you'll discover more. The keyhole is a sort of come on. And the wandering path, which is borrowed again in the tradition of the earlier museum project we made for Frankfurt, the one inside the church. A very simple structuring and a very simple ley light of translucent glass, somewhat in the manner of Stirling's Stuttgart ley light, which we think is very successful because it gives a hint of the presence of the architecture, but doesn't really impede. And then, on the street facade, a very gentle condition. The box doesn't pretend to be anything other than the box that it is. But the only architectural feature are the trail wires up which you encourage the vegetation, which is a sort of memory of the vegetation that was there. And it's also already happening on the flank wall of the academy, just to the right. And these trail wires are hints from the building within. The side towards the garden, which itself is much more syncopated and itself is much more fruity, is also the place where these special rooms with the special art pieces are laid as, as a sort of secondary layer of the building coming into the garden. And so to the street facade, there is this, this hint of the building within with the, with the actual roof structure just, just telling you that it exists, just poking outside dangling these trails. And that's all, a very restrained project by our staff. Over the last two, two to three years, Peter and I have done a lot of projects which have been based in Germany and a lot of projects which have been formulated by German briefs. And one of their characteristics is that they are immensely prescribed. In some, particularly the last project that Peter's just described, the Stadel Museum, the brief was so specific that we knew, all, in fact, all of the competitors in this competition more or less knew what the building was going to look like and how it had to be arranged before pen was put to paper. And I think that I responded to that, not only that competition, but some of the previous ones, by asking myself, well, is that the only way to design architecture? And I embarked on an exercise, which was an exercise just as much in methodology as in the design of an artifact. And I approached the problem with absolutely no brief. In fact, there was no problem, no brief. And I tried to develop um, a design as a result of a series of sequential observations. And so, in a way, it was a very unnerving process because I didn't really know where the observations were going to lead, but it was quite deliberate that it was uh, going to be that vague at the beginning. And also, it was to do very much with context, 
but not context in the traditional sense that architects understand it, where we are taught to observe buildings, where in Europe we are certainly taught to observe buildings in a very hallowed manner, and where the only reference that architecture and architects make uh, are to similar types of, uh, of architectonic substance. And so I chose to look or observe an area of London that I know fairly well, but to observe the context um, as evidence of everyday life. I looked at the way that material was discarded. I looked at the way that areas were vandalized. I looked at the ways that materials and buildings decompose. And in many ways, they were just as much a comment on the way English society lives at the moment, also on the English economy, and also, I suppose, on an incredible sense of frustration and desperation that's felt particularly by very large bodies of young people in inner city areas. And I also very loosely observed the site, a site of a building that used to be a Victorian school and that was burnt out, I think, about 30 years ago, around which a very substantial piece of land exists. And around that land and on it is just evidence of material decay, is evidence, I suppose, of uh, a lack of care a lack of thought, um, and in some ways, I think that this tells you far more about people's attitudes, tells you far more about the way that people feel about their environment, which may be quite shocking. And also I looked at architectural components, not buildings, merely components, some of which were natural, some of which had decayed, some of which showed a uh, fascinating juxtaposition of mechanical order and natural decay, of man-made components such as this sheet fencing which had buckled under weather, which had also been vandalised by fire. and also back to meshes and to screens and to layering, but this time just in the local high street. This time security grills, one laid on top of the other, I think masking a series of washing up bowls on the other side. And also local art, art which in compositional terms is for me just as fascinating as art which is more formally shown in galleries. And also, I think that this says something about the quality of the area that I was looking at. On the right-hand side is a site plan, and if you can see in the top part of the corner a small alleyway with a rather truncated uh, space at the top, which is the site that I eventually chose. And so from the observations of material, from the observations of the way that people discard artifacts and the way that they fairly aggressively adorn walls and floors and buildings. One had to make, um, one had to make some abstraction which could be read in architectonic terms. And so what I decided to do was to compose a wall that somehow made reference to the things that I saw. And that wall was to contain and to wrap around the partly burnt out building. And the architectural substance that was to be imposed on the site was to be at ground level as minimal as possible. And so the ground plan, which is the slide on the left hand side, picks its way through uh, as much of 
the ground level matter or the ground level debris as possible. In a way, it's treated like an archaeological site, and it's the uh, defunct archaeology that determines the pattern at the base plan. And so one can see an abstraction from the metal sheeting, which was made by turning it into a black and white photograph, by trying to observe some of the geometry and also the punctuation of the regular geometry that occurs. And from that, devise the first panel of the wall. The local art is incorporated in a subsequent panel, which in fact is the back of a table which can be let down and suspended from a wire. Each of the panels is joined by an articulated uh, pivotal hinge and it's quite curious that although one starts from a supposedly anarchic, disordered um, initial start point, that vestiges of a very formal architectural training creep back in very gradually. And so the age-old preoccupation with mesh and with ambiguity and with layering is transposed into a subsequent part of the wall which suddenly sprouts a kitchen, which I think now in retrospect is far too architectural for uh, the basic proposition. And one looks at surface and patina and the juxtaposition of geometric order with uh, less ordered devices and tries to capture that in some of the subsequent parts of the wall. And also one tries to also incorporate the random order and some of the geometry and also some of the less geometric insertions such as the hole in the wall in the panelling system that's built up. And that is the beginning of the wall and uh, probably the assembly of half of it. And that's the total wall system. I have to also say that the drawings that were done for this are really frozen in a halfway stage. They are merely sketches and they were just taken off the board and photographed in order to do a lecture, I suppose about three or four weeks ago. So it's very difficult for me to be conclusive about what the building is or what the sequence of development is ultimately going to be. And that, I think, in a strange way, is quite intriguing. So, a more formalized um, interpretation. The wall is now wrapped around the site. The site plan, as I said before, is very largely determined by the objects that lay on the ground. The wall now contains familiar elements of living. There is a table that falls out of the wall. There are certain parts of the wall which are filled with stone and sand in order to provide ins acoustic insulation. There are certain parts of the wall which are transparent. There are certain parts of the wall which are hinged and articulated in order to uh, accommodate the existing building. And also the same qualities that one found in, the in one's observations of the material in the area, I tried to capture in the total feel of the building. The slide on the right-hand side is an upper-level plan of this domestic dwelling, <coughs> which reduces in size, again in, in order to accommodate some of the pre-existent site constraints. And another interpretation in section, which I think is going very much against the character of the scheme. 
ones architectural training is taking over. The, the spaces are becoming very architectonic. And the ordering devices are ominously familiar. And higher up the building, again, the roof plan. And so one hopes that the structure or the enclosure that one has created captures some of the qualities. Um, and I use the word qualities uh, very carefully of the area because that is actually what one is looking at and that is what one is trying to capture. I think that I've slid into a very architectural trap and it's probably something that I'm going to try and break out of in the next stage. But where the next stage of the project is going to go to, I really don't know. And finally, another preoccupation, also perhaps having something to do with patina, having something to do with the irony of the presence of the object. Some of you may recognize Pasadena on the left because it is a piece of hedge that is op opposite one of the many green and green houses that architects like to photograph. But I wanted to face the other way and look at this hedge, which suggested a building or a building in decay or the mysterious hint of a building. The Oslo example on the right, of course, shrouds the building and suggests that a building needn't be full formality, though it may be full frontal. Over and over in early schemes, one has dug around the garden, sometimes on small scale, sometimes on large scale, suggesting that in a crevice there might actually be discovered a building. In a garden, the trees and the, the strange apparatus might actually be discovered to be some kind of enclosure. One can look at specific examples. On the left, the gardens of Schwetzingen, where the armature and the gardening come together and are interdependent. And the effect of patina, this word that Christine used apropos her scheme, the effect of patina that we can see in something like the Pueblo Ribera, Pueblo Ribera apartment uh, in La Jolla, where 60 years of watering and gardening have turned the desert into a garden and have turned this piece of heroic architecture into perhaps an even finer and more extreme and exotic place. I think that really tough and inventive architecture can take the, can take the effect of time. In a garden in Karlsruhe is a strange piece of armature. We don't really know whether it's a building or the outline presence of a possible building and behind it lies the wall which you can walk through, in fact it's a restaurant. So the wall itself, rather like in the early scheme of the cross wall, contains the spring point for this ambiguous place that in the summer does become a building and in the winter becomes the memory of a building. And so another piece of the Skywalk City set inevitably had to get involved with that. There are, of course, funny examples from one's provincial childhood, bathrooms covered with hedges. There are sort of naughty responses. Why don't we put houses in the ditch? There are historic memories of the possible heroism of the garden. And, of course, the London towers, where the damp can trickle down. Another version of the London damp tower, where the garden becomes quite extended, both upwards and downwards. And in a project for a house of two studios, the gardening is not only an adjunct to the building, but at the same time, in the very English tradition, that which gives it privacy. And back to the project for the West Haven in Frankfurt. The garden is here trailed across space and the pavilions that actually from time to time do enclose space are not only rather wayward in their fabric but are very definitely occasional, very definitely subordinate to the, the webs of gardening. 
in the competition for the Kawasaki Information City, this intriguing, but in the end desolate, industrial edge of Tokyo Bay sought the presence of the garden object. And I quite mercilessly borrowed from the West Harbor and then developed outwards from it the interaction of the industrial remnants and the bay and a place where perhaps the citizens of Kawasaki could go needing formalized spaces and sometimes needing casual spaces, needing armatures that sometimes became something analogous to a museum and sometimes small resting places. A very important part of the proposition was places for doing absolutely nothing. Uh, that at the same time could be seen in the tradition of the tea pavilion, the place at which you stop and consider and perhaps undertake a ceremony and sit in your cabin and gaze upon a prepared space. But also this, this jungle of apparatus working together with it. Coming out of that, a series of prepared places scattered amongst the city where the tree symbol is used as a visual memory of the museum in the garden in the sky, which is what I call the project. And the memory that at the seaside, people are more, and at the water side, people are more prepared to do piquant things, even turning the game of pachinko into something of educational value, even turning the modest high street into an adjunct to this museum in the garden in the sky. And so finally, one has the suggestion that this patina, in a sense, becomes of, of, of vegetation, becomes, though not physically, certainly emotionally and, 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 and formalistically the carrying structure of the more architectonic part. And I end on two slides which not only finish the vegetation preoccupation but also return in a sense to the beginning. Mystery can sometimes be the mystery of order and the mystery of space and the mystery of suggestion. And again, the, we have been rather nationalistic, I suspect, this evening, often contrasting our own semi-wayward approach to that of the rest of Europe. We are, after all, when we are in America, we feel terribly European. When we are in Europe, we feel terribly English. And the slide on the right, of course, is Venice, with its perfect architectural conditions. The St. Mark's Square shrouded by mist, and yet it's an architect's photo, feeling that the supremacy of architecture could almost go on forever, and the syncopated order of that classical architecture having the primary place, the primary message to give. But the misted English garden on the left has, I think, more layers to offer. After all, there's the ambiguity of the objects that we can see the foreground, which on the one hand are natural, but on the other hand have been tailored. Man wanting to dally with nature, wanting to fashion it, wanting to turn it into architecture, yet it always wins. The center ground, we can still see objects that are to some extent ordered, but are beginning to be in the natural wayward state. And then further as you go into the mist, the, the offerings become more magical. And so the mist on the left-hand side doesn't offer the certainty of belief in architecture of the mist on the right-hand side. There is no endless city and endless order. But there is something, perhaps, in its inconsistency, much more intriguing. Thank you. There's a reception 
um, in the annex where you could ask questions of Peter and Christine. Thank you.